Dave Weinberg, longtime Press of Atlantic City Eagles beat writer. He joins us each week for a look, midweek look at the birds. And Eagles, of course, at the bye week, Dave. 8-1. I don't think anybody could have predicted it. But if you look at the 8-1 and one start here, I talked about this earlier and got a lot of people's opinions on it, Dave. What would be the moment that kind of springboarded this season uh, to kind of take it where it's gone right now? What's that? Is there like that, that, that game or that moment in this season that you look back to and say, that is why they're 8-1? and one? Wow, that's a good question. There's been so many of them. I mean, especially in the beginning of the year, uh, the very beginning, you know, all their games were so close. Um, I guess I'm up to point with the Giants game, you know, the 61-yard field goal at the buzzer, basically, to to win it. That um, I think that uh, it turns out the Giants aren't very good, but still, I thought that was a huge win for them in terms of their confidence and just giving them a little bit of momentum there. And uh, I'd have to say, like, I'd have to say that was the one that probably. Um, made them think that maybe this is a uh, special season. Yeah, I would agree. That kick, I mean, you take a look at the Fortes, you're right. The Giants going down the drain, but if they win that game on the road, who knows what happens with them, and who knows where that right. takes the Eagles. I think that kick is really the, the, the momentum starter. There's so many other moments of the series, Dave. I mean, I, I go back to the first game of the year against Washington when – uh, Wentz escapes that sack and launches the ball, and who's standing there but Nelson Aguilar? And they, maybe that catch springboarded that kid's confidence into the season he's having. Yeah, that's true. True. You could probably point to every game and find a moment like that where uh, you know someone stepped up, whether it's uh, you know Torrey Smith finally getting on track, or um, like you said, the big catch by Aguilar, and then he had another one a couple weeks later. That's the Cardinals. Um, Right, right. There seems to be this uh, like one game where uh, everybody has a or some person has a big moment or moments, and um, I guess that's kind of what makes uh, teams successful. When you always, when you never know who's going to step up, as you're pretty confident that somebody's going to. You know, maybe not just one person, but maybe it's a position or you know an entire offense or an entire defense. But uh, I think the really good teams they find a way. To, to have those moments almost every week. Yeah, and uh, another one is, I mean, you can make an argument for the play, uh, Corey Kalent making that catch, you know, the throw that Wentz made on that play. But, you know, here's yeah. an undrafted rookie, and he's a local kid that adds to the story. But the contributions they're getting from a guy like that, he had 12 carries last week. He scores three touchdowns. I mean, you can't script some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, and I, even Doug would be the first to admit it. I'm just amazed that they've been able to accomplish what they have with the injuries that they suffered. They just, it seems like every week somebody's going out for the season, but uh, no matter who it is, you know, as long as it's not Carson Wentz, it seems like they have somebody just steps up and steps in and they just keep on rolling. You know, you use Darren Sproles, you use Jason Peters, you use Jordan Hicks. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter. They always have a, a way of, of filling the hole and just uh, keeping things like the status quo. Yeah, Dave, we had a caller earlier in the week ask an interesting question. I'll pose it to you. He asked if sure. Sproles didn't get hurt, would that would the offense have changed? In other words, he was so important in the passing game, and they used him so much. Would they have focused on running the ball if Sproles, in fact, did not get hurt? Well, that is a good question. Um, boy, I don't know the answer. Right. <laughs> um, I, I would think they'd probably be a pretty balanced offense, though. I mean, I'm not sure that Jay Ajayi would be here if Sproles was here because Sproles was very good in pass protection, too, in addition to being a receiver. I know Kenyon Barner wouldn't be here, but um, I, I'd have to think that Doug would probably still feature a more balanced offense, although it would probably be like Garrett Blunt, Sproles, and Clement and Clement uh, getting most of the most of the attention. But, um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know what they would do, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I thought it was a good question. And, you know, obviously he goes out, they ran the ball more, and then they add a guy like Ajayi to uh, this offense. And what you think of the way he fit in? Oh, you can't help but be impressed. I mean, first game, limited practice time, and breaks off a 46-yarder. Um, I was just amazed that the Dolphins let him go, but I guess they're kind of like rebuilding now. I don't know. And it seems like Howie, Howie Roseman and the Dolphins have – some sort of special relationship there, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's that's a, that's a really big addition for them because you know he's that 
we had talked about it last week that he's that home run hitter that they never that they don't have now. And uh, you saw it on Sunday, but then breaking that forty six yard touchdown. How about uh, the fact that they were able to score 51, not only against that defense, Dave, but they did it with arguably without their best offensive weapon. When Ertz went down, you had to start wondering, all right, how are they going to figure out a way to move the ball against this defense? Not only did they move it, they put up a 50-burger. Yeah, it's, I mean, like, I, I just they just keep surprising me every week. Just when you think that this might be – the week where they have a letdown, where, you know, there's an injury that they can't overcome. You know, Brent Selleck turns the clock back about 10 years and makes some nice catches. Trey Burton has a touchdown instead of, uh, instead of Zach Ertz. And they just have a – they just there's something about this team. They just have a knack for process of education no matter what the adversity is in front of them. Uh, they find They still find a way to get it done. Dave Weinberg from the Press of Atlantic City. We're looking at the Eagles at the midway point here. And, you know, another big uh, aspect of why this team has succeeded, as Doug kind of mentioned, you hinted at, is the ability to overcome the injuries. But, I mean, they really haven't been – they have been so unnoticeable that Hicks went out, you wouldn't know it. Darby's been out, you wouldn't know it. This week, you know, Peters is out a couple of weeks. Vitae's kind of handled his own there. Uh, that there is a sign of a pretty good football team. Because this league is about the war of attrition, Dave. You know that. Uh, there's been many years where Andy's last year here, that team was a mess, but they lost four offensive linemen that year. Who knows how different that season is if they're healthy. This team has been able to overcome it. That's the sign of a good football team. Yeah, they have. Uh, I'm really impressed with their depth. I was That was a kind of a question mark for me coming into the year. I didn't know. How those backups were going to were going to fare if they were ever pressed into service, but you got to give Howie Roseman and Joe Douglas credit for finding guys who uh, are not only serviceable backups but are also capable of uh, holding down that position for an extended period of time. Um, I wasn't sure that was the case, especially on the offensive line, but um, by tie has been a, a pleasant surprise to this point. And uh, but I don't know that they can afford. Uh, to lose maybe like Lane Johnson or Jason Kelsey, that might be uh, too big to overcome. But uh, for now, they're they're really playing well, and the, the backups have really stepped up. Yep, and then you got um, what's interesting is Darby has been out. We've only seen him for a half, so we really don't know what he right. adds. But do you anticipate him coming back after this bye week and stepping right in and getting the uh, majority of the snaps? Yeah, I think so. Um, it seems like he's been close the last couple of weeks. He's practiced on a limited basis, but uh, Doug had mentioned that they've been increasing his his workload uh, steadily the last couple of weeks. Now you have a week to rest. Um, uh, yeah, I would fully expect him to be uh, out on the field against the Cowboys, and not only that, but be the starter as well. So whose uh, time gets kind of cut into? What do they you know do at that spot? Because you can make a case that Douglas has played really well. Uh, Robinson, you're not going to really see him leave the field. He's been excellent. Mills obviously has played pretty well. Uh, they, they've been trying to give McDougal more time too. So uh, how do they keep all these guys on the field, or uh, what are the roles moving forward? Um, I'm not real sure, um, but it's a good problem to have. When uh, like just like the offensive line, the secondary has really uh, been impressive to this point. That was considered a major weakness, also. Uh, just because there's so many untested guys out there. But I'd have to think that uh, Darby and Mills will be the starters on the outside. I think Patrick Robinson has played really well. I think he'll probably be the nickel corner. And then they'll probably fill in wherever they need with Rasul or Rob uh, McDougal, like you said. And even Jaden Watkins has gotten some reps. Yep. He had a really big tackle down on the goal line last Sunday. So um, they have a lot of players there. And uh, I guess it's going to be up to, uh, to Jim Schwartz to find a way to fit them all in. I mean, if he has to. Um, one, you just mentioned Watkins in a big tackle. Dave, to me, I talked about this uh, Monday or Tuesday. To me, one of the top three reasons for the success of this football team that's underrated is the fact that they tackle. It's something they did not do in the Kelly era. They didn't do it last year. How many games were lost because they simply couldn't tackle and there was a big play that just turned out to be an innocent little bubble screen or something to that effect, and a guy broke a tackle here, missed a tackle there, and it was a big play. The fact that they tackle is night and day difference. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, 
like 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 you mentioned, even with with the Kelly era, and uh, even even last year, tapping was a problem. Um, Jim, or I'm sorry, Doug had mentioned kind of this week that um, defensive backs by nature really don't, or especially corners, I should say, they don't like to tackle necessarily. But these guys are willing to do it, and I mean, Russell Douglas especially. He's a pretty physical guy. He was known as a physical guy at West Virginia. Um, so I think he kind of enjoys that kind of thing. I was actually talking to him about that last week, and he mentioned that tackling is pretty much more of a mindset than anything else, that you have to want to do it uh, in order to get it done. They don't practice it at all once the season starts. So um, because of the, the, you know, the NFL rules against you know, contact and practice and stuff. So, um, But, yeah, you're right. That's been a, a – that's probably been one of the more impressive things about this defense, the fact that they don't miss many tackles. It's, uh, to me, it's a huge difference. In, in, in the watching these games, uh, these nine games, there's very few times where you could say, oh, that missed tackle. Led. They flat out wrap you up and tackle on the defensive side of the ball. Dave Weinberg from the Press of Atlantic City is with us. Uh, Dave, they're 8-1. and one. Everything feels good, but you got Dallas out of the bye. Then you got that road trip to Seattle. And then the Rams, who would have thought they were going to be a factor uh, for home field? But they're in the mix. And then you got Dallas to close out the year. Of course, you got Christmas night against Oakland. Uh, this season is far from being over. Oh yeah, I mean you can't you can't book those plane tickets to Minnesota just yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the, I mean the Cowboys, as long as Elliott is still out there, and even if he's not, they seem to be uh, kind of finding their their stride a little bit. Um, that's going to be a tough. Task, I think that, that I think they'll probably wind up splitting those games, and but uh, but then again, I mean Seattle, I always I had them penciled in for a loss, but they they didn't look very good last week. So and that's that was at home as well. So um, normally Seattle is pretty much unbeatable in that stadium, but been vulnerable lately. So um, I don't think there's any guaranteed wins here. I don't think there's any guaranteed losses here. But uh, you're right, it will be. I think four of their next five. Are on the road, if I'm not mistaken. The granted one is with the Giants, which I don't know if that counts or not. But um, this is a this is this is definitely the toughest part of their schedule. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, if adversity hits, you know, how they respond. Dave, uh, I looked at your midseason grades and awards, and you gave the coach an A plus. Now, this was a guy that was yeah. said was the worst hire, had no business coaching. Do you think that Doug Peterson is the biggest reason this team is eight and one? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, he got them to not only believe they believe in themselves, and there's that they have that quiet confidence. They're not overconfident. They're not cocky. Um, he's gotten he's done a terrific job of getting them to just focus on the task at hand, not to look too far ahead. Because uh, that's when you wind up getting into trouble when you start to, uh, you know, smell yourself, so to speak, and you, you start to think that you're better than you are. Uh, the goal, I know it's cliche, but the goal each week for them is just to be 1-0. and And um, he's done a terrific job of getting them to buy into that philosophy. He really has. I mean, you got to give him credit uh, for, for uh, the game plan last week I thought was one of the best they'd had. You know, he's had some good ones. Oh, yeah. Even yeah, last year, absolutely. last year he had some good ones where you're like, wow, this was a real, you know, the Pittsburgh game early in that year. He had some good ones early last year. And then they started to, you know, the, I think the lack of talent started to catch up to him. But I thought the game plan on Sunday was one of the best ones that they've had. They went right after Miller and used his strengths to his disadvantage. They went after him and made him overrun a lot of plays. I mean, I thought they really did a good job against him. Yeah, that's what I should say. It's just like it's not just the locker room, and it's not just the mental aspect of it. But he's he's uh, put together some terrific game plans. He's much more um, assertive, uh, much more confident in himself as far as you know what to do on game days. Um, I think it's really interesting the fact that he uh, seeks out Wentz's input into the game plans. He's willing to to listen to his ideas and to implement them if he thinks they're they're going to work. You do, you have like some coaches there that are very set in their ways. Somehow I just can't see Andy Reid doing that. I can't see, <laughs> certainly can't see Bill Belichick doing that. But the fact that he's willing to take outside advice from people, um, that speaks a lot to his uh, character and to his um, willingness to, to do whatever it takes to succeed. Dave, you gave Wentz the offensive MVP. There's no argument there. He's probably the MVP of the league at least halfway through the season. We'll see if he keeps it up. But 
I found it interesting that you went Nigel Bradham for defensive MVP. What has he meant mm -hmm. to the success of this defense? I think he's kind of been the glue that's held everything together, especially when Hicks went out. Um, he's taken on more of a leadership role. Um, he's very, he doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but I think he's their most versatile and their best defensive player. He's the kind of the, the – He's kind of the guy that makes everything go now. He's the one talk, calling the defensive signals for the front seven. Um, never comes off the field. Um, I just think he's, he's – I think he's just having an outstanding season. That's why I gave him the oh. vote. I mean, you can make the case for Malcolm Jenkins or Brandon Graham or somebody, but – I just love that Bradham has been doing things better than anybody else. Yeah, no doubt. He has uh, been an awesome, um, you know, find. Uh, I really liked the signing last year when they brought him in. And, uh, you know, last year he was okay. He, he wasn't great. But this year he has really stepped right. up. And that defensive line, I mean, I'm interested, though, Dave, to see in the second half if they get more from guys like Derek Barnett. You know, the, the rookies who didn't get a big – helping in the first half of the season if they unleash some of these guys in the second half and you see more from maybe a Mac Hollins a Derek Barnett you know guys like that yeah that's a, that's probably a good uh, good question I mean that, I mean a good point there uh, Barnett's been a little bit inconsistent but he does seem to uh, to be improving you know by drips and drabs and I think you might see him uh, as he gets more comfortable with life in the NFL, both on and off the field, uh, I think you might see him become more of a force. Although it seems like that entire rotation there has been working pretty well for them. I mean, Benny Curry's been yes. really coming on like gangbusters lately, uh, which is about time, but it's good to see. <laughs> and um, Chris Long's quietly, he's that steady veteran that comes up with the big play when you need it. Brandon Graham, I think, is having a very good year. And you're right with Matt Collins, too. I think you're going to probably see – Corey Smith's play maybe decrease a little bit because Hollins has proven that he can be that deep threat that they need. <laughs> Pardon me, he's you know, a lot younger too. So uh, I think you might see, uh, like you said, you might see him get uh, fed into the offense a little bit more. Uh, Dave, we know the Eagles play Dallas coming out of the bye, but they also play on New Year's Eve in Philadelphia. Will that game be for the division, or do you think it will be wrapped up by then? Boy, I've been I've been kind of like think, I've been thinking about that, and um, it's kind of tough to think that they would be in that kind of position. I think you'll you'll have a better idea after this month, this uh, Sunday coming up on the 19th. Um, if Dallas somehow wins that game, then I think it's going to come down to the wire. Um, if the Eagles beat the Cowboys in Dallas, um, then I think that might give them a pretty good springboard towards the rest of the for the second half of the season. I really can't see them losing to Chicago or, uh, you know, some of those other teams. I think, like, Seattle and the Rams will be – that's going to – the Rams are really going to be the big test for them, I think. But if they can get past the Cowboys on the 19th, then I think they have um, – I think that'll go a long way towards wrapping up the NFC East. Right. Uh, this game coming out really could distance them from Dallas to really put Dallas out of it, um, and we'll see that all right here on 97.3 ESPN. Sunday night football, a week from Sunday. Dave Weinberg from the Press of Atlantic City here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. All right, Dave, enjoy the bye week, my friend. Oh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it.